any application that exists right now that you're using, and by you, by you, I mean anybody, anything you say or do right now can and will be vulnerable once quantum computing is good enough. And we, him and uh, Dr. Rocha and I agree it's within within 10 years. Anything you say today that is stored on, let's say, WhatsApp server or Signal server or Telegram server, that can come back to destroy your life. Welcome back to another episode of the We Love to Build podcast. As you can see, you can finally see me and the guest because we're going into video from now on. So I have with me today Dr. Eduardo Roja. Hopefully I said that right. Yeah, Jose, it's a difficult way to, it's a difficult family name, but yeah. Thanks. So Dr. Roja is the senior sales engineer and security security analyst for Global Dots, which is an independent cloud and performance optimization integration partner. That's a, a mouthful. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. I really appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what it is you do uh, to make sense of the introduction I just gave, because it's a lot of words. <laughs> Sure, Sean. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. <clears throat> so basically, we Global Dots are a global uh, leader in cloud innovation. Um, uh, we like to call ourselves innovation hunters. We basically connect our customers uh, with the latest cloud and web technology technolo uh, technologies, and that goes from web security, web performance, DevOps, cloud management, cloud security posts, Social management, cloud cost optimization, and also advanced AI and machine learning uh, models. We are a team of uh, experienced engineers and architects offering, you know, an easy end-to-end -end innovation adoption. We will help in consulting, guide you through the implementation, deployment, and also into ongoing professional services. And we will proactively come to you with newer technologies helping to solve the problems that you will kind of face uh, tomorrow, if that makes sense. So it says that you're a sales engineer and a security analyst. Correct. Is this is this a specific goal for the company? They want the people who are selling to be the people who actually understand the security that they're selling rather than just hiring a random salesperson and saying go? Correct. So uh, in Portugal, we have a saying which is like having the hands on the door. So we basically really... Um, work uh, and implement the solutions and also guide our customers in the post-sales um, process of the sales cycle um, and obviously then help them achieving the maximum usage they could have of the security products we put in place. When we think about threats like uh, layer 7 attacks or, or bots, we really make sure that our tools and solutions are performing um, the best they can, minimizing false positives, minimizing false negatives, maximizing true positives, and making sure uh, our customers are happy with the products they get from us. So yes, we we uh, integrate, we implement, and we also then are there for the whole post-sale cycle. You just said a whole bunch of terms I've never heard of, so I'm going to start asking you about them because... Sure. I don't understand them, and I'm pretty sure no. a lot of other people listening don't understand them either. What is a layer seven attack? So uh, you know the um, our internet is governed, let's call it by the Aussie layer seven layer module. We have the transport layer. We have where you know we carry our bits and bytes of our communications. On top of that, we have the layer three and four, which are responsible for the transport and for the session. So organizing all of those bits into trackable. Um, uh, pieces of information and at the top of the layer of this kind of pyramid we have the layer 7 the application layer think of things like http sql and so on so when we talk about layer 7 attacks we talk ag attacks against the application think of sql injections or cross-site scriptings and so on um, that's basically the main task of a web application firewall to uh, detect those attacks uh, and properly mitigate them when we talk, uh, does that make sense to you, Sean? Yeah, sure, continue. Um, exactly, and then I mentioned um, yeah, false positives and false negatives, which is like the, uh, a big problem in the security industry, which is basically making sure we don't 
perform any classification mistakes. A false positive is classifying something as a threat or an attack while it is not. A false negative is classifying something as not being a threat while it is. Um, in the web application uh, firewall world, we use a number of rules and date signatures that are in a database. So we run less into that risk. Of course, when there's a zero day exploit, then we are a bit more behind and have to develop new signatures for this attack. Um, in the bot world, in the automation world, where we constantly battle against web scrapers and fraudsters and uh, try to stop uh, account takeover attacks and, um, and credential stuffing, there it's sometimes there's a bit of a gray area where automation replicates so well the human behavior um, that it's sometimes difficult to properly distinguish between an automated request or uh, or request coming from an automated tool versus a request coming from a real user. Um, and that's where we really have a, a complex uh, battle, let's call it like that, between achieving what I was mentioning before, the maximum performance, meaning detecting as much as we can, the highest true positive rate that we can achieve with the lowest false positive and false negative uh, that is possible, right? So um, in, in this sense, classifying, classifying something as a threat, while it isn't, could have the consequence of a legitimate customer of yours being blocked uh, from you know, finalizing a purchase or something of the like, right? While on the other hand, not detecting a threat would allow that attacker to complete their request, possibly com allowing them to, to perform an account takeover or to perform a, a, a scraping attack. Like, um, yeah. All right, you've given me several more terms that I want to clarify. One of them is uh, zero day exploit and the other is scraping. Right. Um, so a uh, zero day um, exploit is something uh, is an attack for which we still don't really have a signature. Uh, if you remember, um, or for which we still don't have a mitigation, we know how it works, we know what is happening, but we still don't have a signature. So if you think about also the log 4j uh, that we had at the, la at the end of last year, there was a certain period of time in which um, that vulnerability was being exploited, but we weren't aware and we didn't have a signature to properly block it. As soon as the CV got uh, published, we started to um, write rules, uh, looking for instance, for specific strings or values in the user agent of the, of the request that we were seeing um, to properly mitigate them, right? So that was our first attempt at having a signature and passing from a zero day vulnerability to into something that we could properly mitigate with a rule. So earlier you were talking about trying to understand what keeps business owners up at night and trying to solve those problems. What keeps you up at night in, in terms of cybersecurity? Um, do you see any threats that aren't really publicly known very well or, or is there something specific you see coming down the line that really scares you? Um, Yes and no. Um, there's always there's always um, some way of bypassing something, and and um, and um, sometimes what keeps me more worried is some entry point that we're not covering in the whole delivery chain of my customers that then bypasses our protections, um, and. Um, and yes, I mean, launching DDoS and heavy scraping attacks are now very cheap, you know. Um, and uh, it's sometimes it's impressive, like the amount of traffic and and, uh, and attacks that we see uh, on the wires these days. Um, but I, I think sometimes what keeps me worried the most is like leaving some corner uncovered, uh, some entry point. Um, and uh, yes, and in terms of uh, something that we're working a lot in, uh, which is passwordless, you know, and, and having those business not 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 uh, migrating from a password world into a passwordless world, the 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 credential stuff in the account takeovers, right? People uh, having their passwords used in different, um, same passwords recycled and using different portals, and then some password 
data leak and um, and then some successful account takeover that is uh, sometimes difficult to prevent um yeah that that kind of stuff um, i totally agree that we need to become passwordless but what i'm seeing in its place is like biometrics like fingerprints and facial recognition things like that is that any more secure or or are there there attack vectors in that regard sorry to get technical for the audience I, with the word attack vector I, I i think at some point in time and this might be the year or the next year we will migrate from accounts to identities right and uh, um i think your biometrics your your face your fingerprint your IDs or and so on these are but this biometric data that univocally identifies you right and if we could use that um and and drop passwords and usernames which just authenticate my identity with my service provider um we would probably be in a point where atos wouldn't happen at all because uh you know there are no pass or credential stuffing attack because there, there are no passwords to 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 crack or to iterate through um every day uh, um, almost all of us have kind of fido enabled devices uh, at our hands with um you know like we said fingerprint sensors and face ids and so on so if we could use that data to authenticate ourselves with our uh, providers and assure that it's us accessing with our um, biometric data validating that request I, I think we would probably be in a more secure world and we would sleep better at night um yeah i want to push back on biometrics just a little and it's not your fault i'm just uh, playing devil's advocate here when police officers try to find evidence at a scene they often look for the fingerprints of someone left behind Correct, right yeah. If we all are f are moved on to a fingerprint-based biometric authentication kind of standard, wouldn't it be easier to break into people's accounts if you can just lift their fingerprints off of any surface that they've touched? It would be easier to break a password or to find that password dump somewhere to, to, to take out... Uh, I mean, there are a number of uh works in people trying to bypass face id with reconstructing 3d models of people's faces and face id has been very successful in 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 mitigating those with fingerprints yes you could probably snuck out some fingerprints or uh, or an eye god knows you know and and make some kind of fake finger too um but um but at the end of the day um that, those device, those that biometric data would be attached to a device, you know, like my iPhone accepts my face and my fingerprints, not your iPhone. Your iPhone would accept my face or my fingerprints. So there's also a connection between biometric data and my device. My device without by by without my biometric data is useless, and my biometric data with my device is also kind of. But I can always enroll a new device, right? But what happens is that actually, you know, all of that biometric data never really leaves your device, right? Basically, it's kind of a, um, um, a, a uh, like an like an edge computer. It's like a challenge that is sent to you that you sign back with your with your with your with your biometric and send that challenge sign back, kind of a public key uh, cryptography challenge, you know. But at the end of the day, I I, right. I think you know. We, we need a revolution there. We need a change in, into passwords because uh, um, it's not just properly secured anyways. And then we also still rely on uh, two-factor authentication, which helps, obviously. But, you know, sometimes those SMS codes get lost or not sent. You know, there's also SIM swapping attacks that break that. But uh, I think, you know, this biometric is probably as secure as we can get. And probably transitioning from a point where we stop talking about our accounts, but rather about our identities within those service providers, right? And then those bio that biometric data could be the key and the guarantee of um, of of my identity when accessing those providers, like whatever they might be, online retailers and so on. There's 
talk of kind of using blockchain for identity. I'm I'm not against blockchain. I mean, I, I've been involved in the blockchain industry since 2015. So I like it. I know that it's in its infancy. I know that there's a lot of problems with it, most likely, uh, most, mostly scalability. Do you think that blockchain has the potential to kind of get rid of biometrics? Or do you think there's a potential for them to coexist, like biometrics that exist on a blockchain that are verified against a blockchain? Or um, do you think that there's that biometrics would still beat out blockchain that could, um, for security that could and safety? A, a point in time where both coexist and, and, and biometric data, your identity is then obviously authenticated in, in the blockchain uh, through your biometric. I still have to gather my thoughts about it, how these two would coexist, but I I could see a future where, or, or a present where they could um, coexist and hel helping decentralizing authentication, uh, puring it out. But uh, it's, it's a fairly complex topic, I would say. And, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, it's something that most likely will come Soon. So the way that the way that I was thinking about it, and I think the way that other people in blockchain are probably thinking about it is like, like, for example, right now we pair our biometric um, signature to our okay. device, right? So instead of pairing it to our device, we pair it to a transaction that exists on the blockchain. So we, we make a, a payment to the mm -hmm. network and the network stores our biometric data and then whenever we want to log into a device, it just like pings from the blockchain or you send a tra like a mini transaction from the blockchain to that, so that thing. So then mm -hmm. your, yeah. um, your mm -hmm. device, it doesn't matter what device you use as long as you can prove your fingerprint to the blockchain, yeah. something like that. Could, could be something definitely interesting. My, my concern is always somehow your biometric data being stored somewhere else than your local device. Um, but the, there's, you know, it's something that can definitely and will be explored, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's a valid concept, absolutely. So the the reason why I think people are thinking about blockchain for this is because if the goal of Web three and beyond is to decentralize That's things, then having your so basically right now if you're using biometrics and you're just pairing it with your device you your entire biometric information is stored on that single right. device so if anyone gets access to your device the information is there for them to steal now i personally have no idea how that's mm. done um so i'd like to ask you that but before i do that i want to finish my thought real fast so if you were to use the blockchain, you would actually have your biometric data, but it would be spread across potentially millions of different computers. And so it would be basically impossible to hack and therefore steal any individual's data. If so if someone were, oh. sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, go no, on. go on. It's just, yeah, like you do with peer to peer, right? You just store fragments of your identity and then and they can be collected. And uh, yeah, there's a number of ways it can be done. So if it were done like that, would you feel more confident in it? Because you were saying before you don't like it not being on your device, but if it were decentralized across a network, would you feel comfortable with that? Or would you still insist on it being on your device? I'd have to think a, bit, a little bit about that, but um, probably I would feel more comfortable, but I, I'd need some way of uh, showing it's only me accessing that information. Right? But that's, yeah. Um, Okay, that's understandable. But uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if it's decentralized and in, obviously encrypted, which it is, and, and only accessible by me, uh, myself, and I, then it's something I would feel more comfortable with, I suppose. Okay, so I want to go back to that, that question I just had, which was, if someone did get access to your physical device, what would they have to do to be able to actually lift that fingerprint information or that or that eye, you know, that facial recognition information, that signature that you've stored on your device? How how does it get taken? Because I have no idea. Well, probably you'd have to talk with those guys doing the Pegasus spyware. That, um, but uh, 
you probably have to, to crack my passcode, uh, which is, you know, and then from there try to somehow. Um, but I, I, I think Apple and all the other manufacturers make a very good effort in keeping that data, um, you know, encrypted and properly protected uh, within the ships themselves. And I, it might not that be that easy. I, I, I'm not 100% sure if that could be done, but it definitely can be done, I suppose. Okay. So you just mentioned the word Pegasus, and it's something that I've heard of. Um, I don't know how many other people listening have heard of it. Maybe they've just heard the name, but can you just describe what Pegasus is? Well, it was some kind of spyware developed by some firm out there in the world that could basically access all the information in your phone. And they could also, uh, assuming they would have your phone in hand, they could basically access all information by breaking all kind of authentication codes and just get everything up. Now, you just said um, that they have your phone in their hand. Didn't, didn't no, um, think of local they use Pegasus? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. no, go on. No, I was just thinking of those examples where authorities have, uh, have uh, preempted the phones and then they want to access information like it happened a couple of years ago in the States. And um, I think, um, yeah. Wasn't Pegasus used to um, lift Jeff Bezos's WhatsApp messages or something? Can you, do you do you know the details of that? I'm not, I'm not really sure. I've just heard that. I, I'm also not 100% sure, but I think you, get, you receive some kind of image or some kind of file that seemed harmless, and then as it got downloaded into his, I don't know, photo album or so on, and then it could access everything and, and send it to some remote server where it then was, yeah, shared with the world. Hmm. Maybe that was the, uh, the picture of his... Um, uh, yeah. a girlfriend's brother or something. Maybe that was the same uh, thing. Like they were trying to blackmail him, but they sent it using Pegasus or something. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I didn't follow, follow specifically the details, there, but uh, yeah, I, yeah. But it was something of the liking. Okay. So what's your most favorite thing about being a cybersecurity researcher? Um, it's always there's something new in the industry now, you know, like we, we at Cobaldos, we have been um, um, working heavily in, in the bot mitigation landscape. Now we're also moving into the passwordless world uh, with passwordless as a service tools. Also the adoption, the heavy adoption of, of, of the cloud and all the security problems that entails and the solutions that we need for that to have a proper cloud security posture management and make sure that your cloud environment in which public cloud it is, uh, is properly protected and secure, then that's also when an attack comes, again, thinking of that log4j attack, you have the tools, in, the proper tools in place to block those zero day attacks and, and normal attacks. Yeah. So I think that we, we always have new challenges. It never gets boring, like we usually say. Um, and there's always a new problem to try to solve. That's why I mentioned also in the beginning that we at Global Dose, we try to solve a bit the problems that our customers might have tomorrow um, by having um, tools that um, yeah that are a bit uh, yeah innovative, disruptive. So you mentioned Log4j a few times now. I I have to ask, what exactly is that? Well, it was an attack in which. Um, a specific uh, string would be sent with HTTP requests that uh, that then this would be logged by this logging mechanism called log4j. But in the background, that information could be properly processed and triggering some download of some remote code that could be then potentially integrated in your application and then <clears throat> and dumping information from your customers, right? So basically, um, it's been called log4j because it exploited that uh, logging mechanism the log4j and 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 uh, um, and then it would trigger yeah this anomalous request into a remote LDAP server that would then um, allow that let's call it piece of malware or malicious code to download some remote code and then have it running in your cloud infrastructure and whatnot. 
That sounds scary, honestly. Yeah, it was. It was a, an entertaining end of the year last year, um, and uh, and all um, all the security vendors were then obviously trying to put in place signatures, and the attackers are also trying to adapt to those signatures, trying to um, to bypass them. So it's a bit like what we call sometimes a cat and mouse game. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, it never gets boring. But it's also sometimes very scary what the consequences of some of these things could be. Yeah? Sounds like it was a profitable Q4. Uh, no, I mean, all of our customers were actually kind of protected as soon as we got signatures. and, and um, But obviously then some people started to ask how could we protect ourselves against this. And obviously then there are some tools in place that, um, yeah. That then we started to look out for and, and so one of the other things that I'm looking at very very carefully is quantum computing and uh, from what I from the very little I know of quantum computing it seems like all of the cybersecurity architecture and infrastructure that we have right now would basically be Obs rendered obsolete. obsolete once a quantum computer is place, yeah. trained enough. Right. Once there's enough qubits running and there's enough of a, uh, of a desire to destroy the infrastructure, what do you see and, and how, what timeline, you know, how many years, not decades, I think we have years. How many years left do we have until quantum computing kind of takes over and destroys that? Uh, that's a very good question. Probably a decade or less, I don't know. There are some in inclusion libraries in Linux that have already been updated and the US government is also following guidelines to properly address uh, this. Um, but it, yes, it's, it's kind of scary. Any private key could be encrypted in fractions of a second. Um, yeah. um, it's also something that's <laughs> quite scarable indeed and, and could, could and should keep everyone awake. And uh, But I think we're already, they're already having some discussions and uh, some encryption libraries in Linux are also being already kind of updated and we're starting, or the industry is starting to, to address, address this issue as, as soon as we can. Yeah? But how can you address it? Because let's say, for example, you've got a SHA-256 encryption, right? It's designed using traditional code, a traditional language. A non-quantum-based system has created it and manages it. So how can you possibly create additional snippets of code to protect against this algorithm from quantum when we don't even understand how quantum works mm -hmm. therefore how could we protect against it because really what i see will need to happen is we'll need to create new types of um algorithms that are based on quantum te technology but if nobody has quantum technology nobody can create something to protect itself from quantum technology yeah, that, that, that's a very complex topic indeed, uh, but we can already kind of speculate the algorithms and um, and try to propose solutions and start discussing it. But yes, I, I'm also not so much educated about quantum, but I'm following like the recent releases uh, in, in the Linux uh, distros. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something very scary indeed. So, like, what kind of conversations are you guys having? Because I'm I'm not privy to any of that information, so I'm just curious. Um, right now, with my customers, that we're not really <laughs> discussing about quantum uh, and so on. We're just focusing on. Oh, I was referring. I was referring to like behind the scenes kind of developers conversations. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not so much into the develop in the in development like software development world anymore, um, but. Basically, we're, we're discussing the darkness or the most concerning topic is also to evolve into a passwordless world um, and also focusing properly protecting our clouds, cloud infrastructure with uh, proper posture management solutions that uh, will allow us to, you know, um, move from a rule based kind of detection world into kind of a more anomaly and behavior based rules uh, and baseline profile um those are basically the the, conver the yeah the, the the most used topics <laughs> if we 
Okay. So I'm going to just kind of put it out there and, and say as a conclusion to this section that quantum computing has the potential to destroy every single encryption algorithm yeah, that yeah. exists today. Right. Okay, with that in mind, any application that exists right now that it's you're secure. using, and by you, by you, I mean anybody, anything you say or do right now can and will be vulnerable once quantum computing is good enough and we, him and uh, Dr. Rocha and I agree, it's within within 10 years, anything you say today that is stored on, let's say, WhatsApp server or Signal server or Telegram server, that can come back to destroy your life. So if there's anything you're saying or doing that you don't want anyone to find out about, you should not say it or do it on any application, mm -hmm. on any part of the, you know, if you're saying or doing anything... <laughs> Do it in person with your phone off. Don't do it. And your SIM card out. In a closed room. Don't even have your phone yeah. near you. In a closed room, like yeah. have your phone a kilometer away from yeah. you, because the audio devices are listening. Like with this, this I'm, I'm not crazy. Like this stuff has been proven already. I'm just kind of reiterating it. So basically, anything you can, you anything you say or do, and you say something about it to somebody on some encrypted app, it can come back to destroy your life. So stop doing it. Yeah. Probably something of the like, yeah. Like, kind of scary. Yeah. That's the stuff that keeps you awake at night, I suppose, Sean. Yeah, like it it ha it has to because people are just so used to trusting that when someone says this is encrypted that like you're safe, but the reality is you might be safe today, that doesn't mean you're safe tomorrow, and that's only because Correct, technology yeah. hasn't gotten to a point yet where they yeah, can but, take that yeah, information. So by the time it get, uh, gets then kind of more available, we will certainly have everything properly updated i'm optimistic about it but i have to remain optimistic otherwise it's just too difficult <laughs> well i hope so because one of the things like uh, let's circle back to blockchain is that a lot of blockchains are not prepared for quantum technology and some of them say that they're quantum resistant although you don't really know if they're quantum resistant until you try to break it with a quantum computer so you got to just kind of take people's word for it but you know, if we're trying to base our future on this this new technology as a financial mm -hmm. instrument, but it's potentially you know fallible to quantum computing, like we just have no idea. So, like I'm I'm short term and medium term, meaning like five five ish years. I'm still bullish on blockchain, even though the world's basically melting down right now. Like literally, blockchain, mm -hmm. the total market cap of of uh, all of the cryptocurrencies has just gone under one trillion okay. yesterday for the first yeah. time, and I think a year and a half. It's like everything is melting down, but uh, I still believe that for blockchain as a technology, there's a big future for it. But um, long, long term, post quantum computing, I just don't know like where it's going to be, and it could potentially be absolutely destroyed by quantum. Although quantum could take over, and we might have quantum chains, and then it's all solved. But yeah, um, but yeah, it's a very interesting future. Cybersecurity is very, very important. Um, you know, from where I'm standing, yeah, and cool. and uh, like. Yeah. I, I, I may sound like I'm really knowledgeable, but I am not a technical person. I'm just a guy who like spends a lot of time researching stuff. Yeah. But by the time it comes, I hope we will have everything kind of properly updated, our encryption algorithms, our encryption keys and, and all of that. So we still have some time. Um, and it's incredible how we how much we can adapt to a fast-paced world, the, the community and... and, and all the security vendors out there so i i'm relatively optimistic yeah but yes it's it's a big problem that lies ahead and uh yeah from zero to 100 percent, how optimistic are you or how confident are you that we'll we'll solve these problems before they just they destroy the traditional like somewhere system? between 70 and 80 percent of you know, i don't know that's great I, um, i'm in a good mood. i wish i were you <laughs> yeah <laughs> I wish I were you. I'm I'm more at about thirty to forty yeah. percent uh, confident. No, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I try to remain a bit positive, and uh, I, I also see how, how good we adapt against the threats that we fight nowadays and the cool new tools that we have. So, I think the industry together can can pull miracles, and also we have governments also looking into this problem to help us protect our identities online and and all of. So yeah, I remain optimistic until until proven wrong, which might happen. But uh, I, yeah. 
I'm I'm inclined to feel more optimistic after what you've said, just because you're in this every day and I'm not. And if that's how you feel, then surely you're seeing a lot more than myself and others are seeing. And so may, maybe I should be more more um, positive about that. At the same time, you said governments are working on this. Yeah, okay. I get the feeling the governments don't really care about the individual person's data. They care a lot more about their, them getting caught with their pants down with all of their secrets being exposed oh, to, too, right? to the so, world. If, if, they don't, if they don't protect their algorithms yeah. better, if they true. don't find a way to upgrade it. So, plus they're also probably looking at how they can control quantum computing in order to protect themselves and to hurt their enemies or to spy on their enemies okay. and possibly their citizens in a more yeah, um, for... private way. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there anything we didn't really hit upon that you would like to discuss? Um no, I, I think we went through everything kind of I in mind. Uh, we went through cloud security, we went through identity and passwordless future. Um, so we talked about the current threats, the layer seven bots, and um, we could probably have another session sometime about AI, but uh, let's keep it for another session as it's such a long topic. But uh, no, I, I think we cover succinctly most of the topics and yeah I, I i need to pull on this now this thread you mentioned ai and i was also thinking about vr cybersecurity and vr um if you had to choose one of the two as the final topic for today which would you choose we'll go down that one I don't know, artificial intelligence, machine learning is something we are working uh, on global odds, uh, trying to solve problems of our customers based on data that they have using algorithms that are a bit, uh, yeah, uh, out of the box and so on and trying to extract data. We usually say data is the new oil and the way, and we have data coming from so many sources um, uh, be it your CDN, be it your security tools, be your IoT devices and so on. And um, so all of that data will hold some secret that will probably bring your business forward. And we're also working together with our customers and prospects to kind of help understand what would they like to extract from that data and having um, the proper algorithms kind of um, implemented by our department and help them like reaching that um yeah that goal so ai and cybersecurity. i get the sense that there's and they, there's a way to use sorry no go ahead please yeah sorry i i get the sense that there's a way to use ai to better yeah exactly like i i i, I feel like there's a way to use ai tools to improve your cybersecurity. Right. like so basically, I, I've I've seen platforms coming out where they use AI models or machine learning algorithms to scan your code as like a code review before you you push code. I've seen it for software testing, um, you know, to test against the the you know the different rules that you need. I I get the sense that you can maybe there's somebody already doing it. I'm not sure if there is. I'm not really like, it's not what I'd look at often, um, but I'm curious about it. Maybe there's a way to use AI to kind of automate the process of looking for attack vectors, yeah, looking for, for holes in your code. Exactly. And and it comes a bit also into what we were talking about, these kind of uh, um, dropping rule-based approaches into having more kind of a baseline. You know how your cloud environment behaves, what is a normal profile, everything or anything deviating from that could be a threat, right? So that calls out for attention. We also do that a lot in the, um, in the security world. We know how legitimate users experience and interact with websites. So any kind of deviation uh, from kind of that profile could indicate a threat. Um, also, you know, like when you, when you interact with the uh, mobile apps and so on, your devices will have certain characteristics. So you can be, use AI or machine learning to kind of build a baseline of what your normal 
behavior is and how normally your cloud environment behaves and so on, and then kind of use that to establish deviations, which could indicate an attack, uh, a vulnerability being exported and stuff like that, right? So that's where it could come into play and it's already coming into play with, with some of our products in, 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 in our portfolio. Um, but the idea here is always to kind of have what, we, what I like to call a positive security model. Like I know how this behaves um, if it behaves differently, then something is odd and we should check into that. Like if user A never access server Y and starts accessing it and calling some remote uh, server, then that calls for attention, right? Um, so that probably would allow you to, to drop rules and, 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 uh, and be able to detect vulnerabilities or, ex uh, or, um, uh, and their exploitations on the go as they have a different behavior, different baseline uh, than what your typical profile is. Yeah. So if you could create a model to look for holes in your code that you need to plug, how easily could a bad actor use the same tool to try to find holes in your code so that they can hack you? Uh, the biggest problem is <clears throat> a lot of people embed open source code in their projects and it, it's a known problem that hackers contribute actively to or may try to contribute actively to open source and then you embed the, that code um, and co yeah uh, code scanning will help you kind of finding um, some of those less secure libraries and replacing them updating them um, so that that's something that's also being done yeah all right great so how can people follow up with you um yeah find me out on on on, on linkedin find our sales global in, in in linkedin and uh on twitter and um yeah and in our website in a more traditional way all right great so i'll have all that information as well as a transcript for this episode on the show notes at we build.com and thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me, Dr. Rocha. If you like this episode, definitely leave a review on Apple or Spotify, as well as uh, follow us on YouTube, where these episodes will live. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And your cybersecurity is extremely important. And as you've heard from this episode, it's constantly evolving. There's tons of people trying to hurt you and steal your, your code and your IP. And you just have to stay vigilant. And uh, if you don't know much about this stuff, then hopefully this was a rude awakening for you. And you start to think about how you can protect yourself and your team and, and your, uh, you know, your property so that you can continue to bring money in and, and serve your customers in a safe and, uh, you know, secure right. way. Thank you, Dr. Rocha. Thanks, Sean. Within 10 years, anything you say today that is stored on, let's say, WhatsApp server or Signal server or Telegram server, that can come back to destroy your life 